Hi everyone, Josh with Talk About Trek here, and we're back today with another Star Trek book talk because we have finished The Eyes of the Beholders. <clears throat> so, uh, this is a novel by A.C. Crispin, and before I get into it, let's just kind of uh, read the front and we'll read the back here. A mysterious alien artifact could mean death to the USS Enterprise crew. Okay. <clears throat> After several Federation and Klingon ships disappear while traveling a newly opened trade route, the USS Enterprise is sent to investigate. Their quest leads Captain Picard and his crew to an eerie space graveyard full of ships of every size and description, all of them dead in space. As the center of the graveyard lies a huge, incredibly powerful artifact, constructed by an ancient alien race. And as the crew struggles to solve the mystery of the artifact, they unwittingly trigger its awesome power. A power that threatens insanity and death to all aboard the Starship Enterprise. Again, not a very apt uh, description on the back. Kind of is right, but really does not really hit the nail on the head. Uh, so we'll talk about this book kind of in two parts. So the first part, we'll just kind of go over it a little bit, and I won't get too much into details, give you my thoughts. And then I'll just start ranting about the whole thing, because uh, let me tell you, the last three of these TNG numbered novels that I have read, which would be uh, 11 or 10, 11, and 12, all really kind of painted the Enterprise crew as somewhat inept. Uh, they had new characters introduced that didn't need to be there, and it just kind of all three kind of took me out of it, and it didn't feel like an episode of Star Trek. Now this book, this feels like a really fun two-parter of TNG. So uh, let's kind of dive right into it. So it's set about five weeks after Q Who. Uh, so they, they do date it right to then. And uh, it does feature, uh, I love that they did this. Um, they do bring in kind of a new character to give like a different perspective, you know, for the author to write. But they bring in a guest character. So they bring in Dr. Salar who was only featured in one episode, which was, I think, a second season episode, episode uh, The Schizoid Man. Uh, but she was mentioned in a few other episodes, but only appeared on screen once there. And, of course, did uh, the actress, Susie Plaxton, did go on to play uh, Kate Lar and, I think, uh, several other uh, characters in different series there. Uh, but it's awesome that they, the, the author chose this one character to kind of take and expand upon and get to learn a little bit more about. So in the book, you know, you do learn a little bit more about her. Uh, but what's really great about the book is it just reads like kind of a like a classic TNG episode. You know, lots of different viewpoints from the characters, uh, lots of conference room scenes. Oh, I love a good conference room scene, right? So, so many in this. And as you're reading it, you can just get the sense that either the author himself watched a lot or just did a good amount of research because in reading it, it feels like, you know, you're reading an episode. So I think that was really great. So uh, all in all, uh, not getting into spoilers anymore here, I would say this is definitely like an 8 out of 10 book for me. It's not like a high action adventure, but it has got a true like Star Trek mystery, which I think really drives the story and is awesome. And it also leads for some interesting way for the author to talk about and include you know, some fun backstory for characters. So, uh, spoiler free, I would say, get up and read it. Okay, so from here on out, we're just going to get oh, deep into the spoilers. All right. So this book is so good. Now, the last three books I read, I enjoyed them. They were fun. But this just, like I said, it feels like I'm watching an episode. So the book picks up basically with kind of like three intertwining stories. You have this uh, mystery of these disappearing ships. So they are tasked to go investigate this trade route. There's been disappearances of Klingon ships, Federation ships, and uh, they need to see what's happening. So they're on their way out there to do that, and they start introducing these kind of little uh, side stories while they're on their way out. And one is uh, Dr. Silar and her relationship with this little Andorian girl named Thala, and she is, has been blind from birth. And as you can see on the cover there, the uh, like little dots on her shirt are uh, what's called a sensory net that helps her like navigate around, even though she's blind. 
So that's the uh, the little small story they kind of start in this is the relationship <clears throat> the relationship between them two. Uh, she actually lost her father, who was an ambassador in the Borg attack in Q Who. So she's been orphaned on the ship ever since then, and Doctor Solar has kind of you know taken over and taken care of her. So they do also give some fun backstory on Doctor Solar, which I thought was nice that she was. <clears throat> A uh, Vulcan that was betrothed to be married to someone and just didn't feel like she was compatible. So she chose to leave, she chose to join Starfleet, and was kind of shunned by her family because of that. So I think anytime you can give a little backstory to a small side character, I mean, that's always fun. So they get information now from Starfleet that there's another ship that has went missing, and they're trying to kind of figure out what is the space pirates, you know, what could this be? So what do they do? They have another conference. They have lots of conferences in this book. So anytime something happens, they call a conference. You get the viewpoint, you know, from every different character. Uh, they find that the latest ship that was lost wasn't carrying anything of value. So obviously it's not pirates. There, there's something else going on there. Uh, they do actually drop in another little cameo from a great character, Sonia Gomez. Uh, shows up just for a short scene, I think, the in engineering. And, of course, she was great in the episode... Uh, Q Who, of course, and then she they brought her back in Lower Decks, which was awesome. So, uh, oh, and also they give you this kind of little C story, which I think is maybe the, the comic relief that they're trying to put through, which is Data writing this silly little love scene, and kind of he's been taking it around to his friends and asking them to proofread. So he starts by taking it, I think, to Geordi first, and, and uh, each time... Uh, each of his friends, they don't want to give him their honest opinion. Uh, I mean, it reads like it's terrible, uh, but but it's very, very funny. Uh, but each of them doesn't want to give an honest opinion, so they kind of give a... It just maybe maybe change this, maybe change that. So he changes something up in it and then goes to a new friend to read it. And that's kind of like the comic relief uh, side story that's playing throughout the whole thing. So they finally do get close enough to actually receive a message from one of the missing ships... And it basically is, uh, they can tell that people have gone mad. So now they have some kind of idea, some kind of like naked now kind of scenario going on. Uh, some kind of madness is happening there. Uh, when that happens, <coughs> uh, they get close enough to this thing. And then uh, Troy is able to sense this and is basically just knocked out. And kind of written out of the story right there like in chapter, I think it's about chapter four or five. And they got to put her under for fear if she wakes up and feels these feelings that she will not be able to take it. So they do, uh, they get close enough now where they actually get trapped into this beam and they decide not to try to attempt to escape yet, but rather let's be pulled in and let's see where it takes us, kind of get to the middle and see what we're going to do. So they do get drawn into the middle and this is the part where it gets very, very, very interesting for me. So when they get to the middle and they have the object on screen, which they call the artifact, uh, when they first view it, no one can actually look upon it without getting like physically ill. And the reason is because it is so alien looking that our eyes and our brains just simply cannot comprehend looking at it. And just even trying to get like that in your head it's kind of a hard concept, but such a fun concept to think about. Like, what? how could something be so alien that just the mere looking at it uh, kind of makes you crazy, you know? It just makes you sick to your stomach. You can't stand to look at it. Your brain just can't make sense of it. So here is this whole giant thing um, that has been sucking in hundreds of thousands of ships, and they're all just kind of floating in dead space around it. Uh, they decide, okay, so we need to definitely not look at it. So they darken all the view screens first. And they, first things first is that there are some life signs on one of the ships. The, uh, the latest one that was kind of sucked in. And they do send an away team over there. And this is where Dr. Solar kind of gets to shine. And they send an away team over there to rescue the remaining people. Now anyone that they find over there is basically catatonic... Uh, they see people that have committed suicide, people that have killed other people. So the effects of this artifact are definitely having their toll on everyone here. Uh, so it is a, uh, a successful mission there. They're able to get all the survivors back. Uh, 
get them back to sick bay. <clears throat> and in part because of a uh, because of Dr. Salar. Um, one of the away team actually kind of freaks out and goes crazy, uh, gets affected by the artifact, and she's able to get around him and give him a nice Vulcan nerve pinch to knock him out. So it gives her kind of a cool moment on there. And uh, it just... It's nice to have, like, a... You, know, you read so many Star Trek novels where they have, like, a new character they want to put in. But I just like to see a character that we know about get kind of fleshed out and given more life. And from what I understand, there are books further down the line in, like, a different series where she is actually, like, a chief medical officer. So, you know, that'd be cool to look into in the future. Um, also, this, uh, the artifact, um, what it does to people also is give them the most crazy, vivid dreams. And the way that anyone that comes out of this describes it is basically like, it was not a dream, you feel like you were just there. So if you were there, and you were just eating a bunch of stuff, and you come out of the dream and you're full. So this whole dream sequence, dream sequences, is another way that the author, I think, really shines in this book. Because he's able to take, uh, I think throughout the whole, kind of this little middle section of the book, they have three, four, four or five dream sequences. And they vary from, uh, like, really frightening to, you know, like, lost love stuff. And just really awesome backstory on the characters. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, but So they do <clears throat> come back with the, uh, the crew of the Marco Polo. Okay, so they got the crew back. They're good. And they've saved everyone they can. So now it's time to figure out how to get out. So they try phasers on the thing to no effect, uh, and they decide, well, the only thing that we can really do is try to figure out a way to shut off this field that is trapping us. So they have to send over an away team. But how can they really do that without even being able to look at this thing? So uh, without really having a choice, and this, you know, they do have another conference, I think a series of conferences. Again, so many conferences, and this is what it's lovely. Uh, and they decide that they are going to go over there. All right, so before we get to that, let's go over some of these dream sequences because that is actually, I think, so you got the main highlights of this book are like this, the coolness of this artifact and then also just how he wrote these dreams. Uh, so they have one of these dreams, which is basically a terrible nightmare for the young Andorian girl, which is her reliving like the aftermath of the Borg attack. And then, uh, so it goes completely the other way, and then you have, like, Riker's dream, which gives, like, a, a nice long backstory about, like, him in the Academy, uh, the first lady that he ever loves, uh, who, when he's shipping off, tells him, you know, just forget about me, you know, I'm gonna leave. So kind of like your cliche love story thing, but just nice, fun little backstory, little filler for the book, you know? And it just, I love to have little backstory on all my favorite characters. Uh, Captain Picard's was especially cool. His dream was the immediately aftermath of them losing, or the immediate aftermath of losing the Stargazer. So him and his crew, uh, wounded and weary in the shuttles, returning to Federation space. You know, the Stargazer is a gift, a drift, and just you know nearly destroyed. Uh, so that was also really cool, really well written, written scene. And uh, just, I love, like I said, more background on your favorite characters is always fun in a book. Um, Worf also had a really cool dream, kind of showing him younger, and him in, like, the the day before the big attack on Kittimer. So, again, they kind of revisit all these awesome parts, uh, but one, I think, of the very, very best sequences was not even one that was, like, a, a dream told by the author, but it was, it was Dr. Crusher retelling her dream, uh, to someone else and her dream was basically just this really wonderful day that she had with her husband and son that at the time she didn't know but afterwards you know after her husband passed away she realized that it was actually the best day of her life you know and it was just kind of one of those moments that makes you think you know it's like wow I mean, you never know when that moment's really gonna be it's crazy so I really like how he wrote that that was really 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 well done and I really was actually very touching. So, top-notch work there, really. Uh, all right, back to the story. So, they were going to send an away mission over to the artifact that they can't look at without throwing up. So this is maybe kind of the worst decision they make in the book, I would say. 
Uh, they beam over with uh, Riker, Worf, Jordy. Now, Jordy can actually view this thing without getting sick, since he's blind. Uh, the visor just kind of presents like a series of like color patterns for him when he looks at it. Uh, Data as well can can stand to look upon it, uh, but it does cause some trouble to his like positronic net. So they decide they're going to have to beam over there and see what they can do. So they get the team together, and they do need a doctor over there as well. And they found that the Tellarites are kind of immune to this. The, it doesn't affect their brain as much. So they have a Tellarite doctor on board named Dr. Gavar, who they decide to send with them. So <laughs> as soon as they beam over to this thing, you get basically uh, four scenes with all uh, Riker, Geordi, Worf, and Dr. Duvar. And each of them immediately beaming over and like, not only can they not look at what's around them, the, the input, the sensory input on their skin is like driving them crazy. The, the sounds that they're hearing are driving them crazy. So in a matter of seconds, uh, Riker is on the floor in a ball. Uh, Jordy is lost his visor and has gone crazy from the sounds. Uh, Worf is driven into like a crazy feral rage. And Data immediately shut himself down as soon as they came in, leaving just Dr. De Gavar, who also is still affected, even though her brain isn't as affected, so she has to rescue the whole away team. So she gets kind of a fun little scene here where she ends up stuffing her ears, wrapping things around her eyes, and then kind of blindly fumbling around, gathering up all the away team, and getting everyone back to the Enterprise. So after that failure of a mission, uh, Riker is still catatonic. So they've got to figure out a way to bring him out because they need to have another conference and they want everybody there, you know. So they do, uh, they wake up Counselor Troy just enough to bring Riker out of it in the end so they can have one final conference and even Worf in his like half asleep state after that thing, he kind of stumbles in to sit down because he doesn't want to miss the conference. Everybody's got to be there for the conference. And they just, they have to figure out a final plan. And it comes down in the end to, okay, are we going to blow this thing up? Or are we going to try to figure out a way to shut down the thing? How can we go over there without shutting it down? You know, or how can we go over there without ourselves getting shut down? And figure out a way to shut this field down so that we don't have to destroy this thing. Now, of course, Worf, Riker, they are both on the page of let's, let's blow it up immediately. We need to get rid of it. Um, the rest of the crew is being affected by this. People are starting to die. There's actually been some suicides on the Enterprise, some attempted murders. So things are getting bad, even though they don't, in the book, they don't make it seem like it's a terrible, urgent issue. But it's just so fun that it kind of carries you along anyway. But, so they have the conference and that side going, and then they have Data and Geordi. And Geordi says, no, it's beautiful. We have to find a way to save it. It's more than just some weapon or something out there. And then throughout this conference, they surmise that what this thing actually must be is some sort of art gallery. So after taking everyone's opinions, of course, uh, Picard decides, yes, you know, we have to find a way to save this. How can we do it? And then with a little bit more back and forth, they come up with the fairly simple solution of reprogramming data. So Dr. Salar gets to come in again and basically they reprogram data to be able to adjust and interact with this reality, you know, with this alien reality. But what that will do is make our reality seem alien to him. So again, this is a concept that's hard to get my head around, you know, to really think about how is something so alien that you can't even look at it without, you know, kind of losing your mind or, you know, being able to comprehend it at all. But they do figure out a way to basically program data to be a new data and an old data so that he can shift into this new data, go over there, walk around, and actually see it as these aliens see it. So uh, they are able to successfully do that, and they have to shut him off and turn him back on. And they do that like right in the transporter room. And as soon as they turn him on as new data, he's freaked out because being on the Enterprise is all of a sudden alien to him, just like the artifact is alien to them. So he's scared and freaked out, but they beam him over there, and he's able to kind of, he remembers his mission. And the last couple chapters are, maybe it's just that chapter, it's fun how it's written, 
because it's from a perspective of data uh, looking at this through this new mind. So he does determine that basically what this place is is like an alien art gallery. Or even bigger than that, like a natural museum, like an arc of their whole civilization. Uh, he's able to explore around. He can look and see that it's not only just art like pictures on the walls, but it's like amazing moving holograms that are not only just things to look at and see, but also like kind of bombard you with sounds and emotions and other things. And that's why this field that they were all stuck in was just too much for normal humanoids to take. And that's why it was giving them these dreams and making people go crazy because it was meant for these completely different alien beings. So uh, finally we get a nice big lore dump right at the end, of course, when Data finds the, uh, he finds the computer which explains exactly what the place is and what everything is. And it turns out that these, uh, the creatures that built this thing were l lands, Y-L-A-N, that's what I'm going to say. And they're from the planet La, and they had a terrible solar flare on their planet, which wiped out most of their population and made the rest of them not able to procreate any longer. So they decided to continue on their civilization. They would build this giant ark, so all, and... Uh, this civilization, too, was not a civilization that was warlike at all. So it was a, a basically a whole planet of creators, you know. So they built this huge, fantastic art as their last final thing, you know, as they were finally dying, and shot it off into space and kind of sent it towards the Milky Way, not knowing that what they were doing was actually basically sending, like, a giant death curse <laughs> towards everyone over there. Because how could they know that they'd be sending it to people that were so alien, it would actually act as a weapon to them. So over millions of years, this thing floated through space, gathered up these ships, and you know killed all these inhabitants, until finally the, the brave crew of the Enterprise stumbled across and was able to solve the mystery and, and get things sorted out. So... Just a lovely little story all around. You get a wrap-up for all your little side stories in here. Uh, Dr. Salar does end up actually adopting this young Andorian girl named Thala, and it adds kind of a nice little wrap-up to their story. And uh, Oh, and also Data's book as well. Uh, throughout it, like I said, throughout the story, Data was going through to his friends and asking kind of for a little bit of input on the book, and he would read a passage from it, or they would read a passage from it. And each time it was ridiculous, and he would rewrite it in the style of a famous author. He does, I think, Hemingway, and he does in the style of Jane Austen. Uh, and finally, he takes it to Counselor Troy, who in the end is finally honest with him, and just says, no data, your book is terrible. And he's not upset. He's actually he's happy. He says, well, thank you, finally. Someone gives me an honest opinion. And he goes to the, uh, he takes his book with the help of Jory to the transporter, and he beams it out into space in a symbolic gesture of kind of being moving on from it and decides, you know, he can't write a book from a human perspective. Uh, he's got to do something else. And in the end, it's actually kind of uh, tied up nicely for him is that he is asked as one of the only ones who can now go and look at this mystery, who can actually walk over there and see it with his eyes, to help document it. So he will actually get to write something, which will be a documented history of these people. So, uh, wow, what a fun book. Really had a good time with the eyes of the beholder. I would say my favorite parts about it, uh, just the having to think about an object so alien you couldn't look at it, or a sound so alien you couldn't, this uh, listening to it would drive you crazy. Like, well, what is that even? How could, you, you can't even really, it's hard to even comprehend. So anytime that a little novel like this gets you thinking about fun stuff like that, uh, that's really good. Again, the high point, also the, the dream sequences that he wrote in there for the characters were all really fun. Uh, some really touching moments in there. Uh, I would say this is probably the best Star Trek novel that I've read in a while. And that's just because the last three have been a little unfocused. And this really felt like I was reading an episode of Star Trek. You know, this would make a very nice two-parter. So, if you're looking for a little bit of fun, read The Eyes of the Beholder. I did, and it was good. All right, so what's up next? We're going to move right on to number 14 with Exiles.
And we're going to jump right into that soon, and uh, hopefully that's going to be as fun of a little uh, mystery as this one was. So, whew. anyway, thank you all for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Live long and prosper. Bye.